they just found this dynamite and you said 450 pounds we're going to talk about the guy we're going to talk about why this is was such a big thing i mean i know it's a big thing but like why did why did this guy do this we assume it's a guy nicole is going to be reading from two books and one of them is by harold Schechter, which is one of my favorite true crime authors the second book she's reading is The Bath Massacre, America's First School Bombing by Arnie Bernstein. This, this is a really good book. I really enjoy this book. I've never even heard of this author before, but she, uh, oh, it's a he. I guess Arnie. Yeah. This is uh, what he's also written. So Swastika Nation. That's cool. This was a really good book. But we stopped at the school being, being exploded and all the children getting pulled out. The fire chief and the deputy sheriff. They're pulling out this rubble and they see these wires. These wires are connected. They run all through the school on every column. Every column in the school has these wires stapled running down and they all run to this single hot shot battery, which is basically like a car battery. This battery, which is also hooked to a clock. Now, the 504 pounds of unexploded dynamite, which they would eventually find, did not explode because of a little crimp in the wire. Wow. A little crimp stopped an electrical signal from reaching the other the other dynamite. Was it still, though, really dangerous when they were trying to pull... Oh, yeah. Stuff out. Like, could it have gone off at any point still as they were kind of trying to pull people out of the rubble or even as they were digging that out? Like, that's to me, that still could have been an even bigger disaster, right? That's a good question. So, unfortunately, we probably have some more lost lives because of that. Because when they found the wire still attached to all the dynamite, still attached to the blasting cap, still attached to the battery, still attached to a clock that was still ticking, they realized that this bomb could go off. So what happens? The search has got to be called off. They call the search off. So they kids, evacuate gosh. whoever was not a victim. Just no, all the everyone leaves. <sighs> I'm not out. Everyone kind of backs up. They can't search anymore until they know that it's safe to search. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like they yeah. had to evacuate everyone who was yeah. there. Yeah. So all the kids, you know, are still there being, you know, smothered to death. Jeez. That's terrible. You don't even ask how many dead children there were. We guessed and you how haven't much? told us. No, you guessed the amount of victims. I said 79. I said 100. In total. In total, there were 38 children mm. deceased. 38, 44 in total with the adults. Oh. 55 non fatal injuries. And by non fatal, I mean like legs missing and stuff. Blinded for life. Yeah. Type of thing. That's, uh, and then and then even if even if you didn't lose a limb or were have a physical injury like that like what if what about the chemicals that they probably inhaled from the particles from the dust in and debris yeah. like you, you don't like the building materials that they used way back then were definitely not bored or good, proved good point probably inhaling a lot of asbestos yeah in all, 504 pounds of unexploded dynamite and pyrotol were pulled from the building on May 18th. The material included at least nine bushel baskets full of dynamite, several 30-pound sacks of pyrotol, 10 blasting caps, and two timing devices. An estimated 100 pounds of explosives had detonated beneath the North Wing. 100 pounds of explosives. So 500, were, 504 pounds were unexploded. So just that damage from 100 and there were 500 left. Wow. So he was trying. So the whole, like the building, the entire building and the surrounding probably like trees and whatnot around it would have all been totally annihilated. Yes. This guy who we're going to talk about, his intention was to kill 250 people. Everyone in that building he wanted dead. Everybody. It's, from, it's like the Timothy McVeigh, you know, like Unabombing. You know? Uh, yeah, no. And there would have been 250 or at least 200. Jeez. But a a bad connection in a wire stopped the dynamite from exploding on the south end of the school. The north end is toast. Yeah. The south end, not exploded. All the dynamite's there. You and know, it's been there, actually, for months. It's a little ironic when you think about it, because typically faulty wiring ends up in something negative. But in this case, it ended up in something positive. Yeah, no kidding. So, I mean, it's hard to say that it was a like since it was already a such a disaster and so many lost their lives. But like, thank God it could it could have been way, way worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Way worse. But it also really sucks that as soon as they found it, they had to stop 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Trying to save who they who else they could have saved. Which is understandable but still upsetting. Yeah. Like if sucks. I was a parent, I would be even there more anyway. devastated. Yeah. Because yeah. you like you're it's like what you're are you thinking doing? I could have had a chance to maybe save my child. Right. Because at that point you don't know when like if your child is in that debris and they stop, you don't know when and and then your child ends up not making it. You don't know if your child didn't make it because of the initial blast or if because they were suffering in the debris and they stopped looking you don't Ugh. know this hurts my heart it's just a very very upsetting situation yeah all right well it's gonna get a little bit more upsetting perfect love it Great. monty ellsworth was driving his ford pickup truck to the school and all of a sudden he sees another truck come barreling down the street barreling down the road in the direction towards the school as well and he recognized immediately who it was now this whoever was driving this truck was speeding like a demon he looks over in the and he can see through the window that it's andrew kehoe that's the the mask thought you're gonna say andrew cunanan for a second quote he could clearly make out kehoe's face contorted into a ghastly grin like oh. the like the rictus of a corpse ellsworth would never forget that chilling expression quote i could see both rows of his teeth he oh. would later say i'm imagining like a cartoon villain like driving maniacally down the road it, yeah mm-hmm. like cruella de villain yes. the scene from the 101 yeah, donations like, yes exactly that's what it i mean i could see both rows of his teeth this man, Andrew Kehoe, this killer, both rows of his teeth with this maniacal, demonic grin. Huh? He, he would never forget that expression. He knew exactly where he was going. He was going to admire his work. Ugh, I don't like that. No. Yeah. Now, the superintendent, his name is Emery Hoyuk. He's going to be really relevant in this story. The superintendent, Superintendent Chalmers mm-hmm. from The Simpsons. Yes. Oh, I, I picked it up. It's okay. The superintendent, Emery Hoyuk, and the mass killer, Andrew Kehoe, were like enemies, almost. Andrew Kehoe was the treasurer of the school. And we're going to get into why that's important here in a minute. He was also the janitor slash maintenance man at the school. Basically, that's important because he had unlimited access day and night to all of the structure mm-hmm. of the school. Mm-hmm. Thus, that is why you find all the wiring, all the, bo- all, the, all the dynamite placed in the walls and the plaster of the walls. He had unobstructed access to the entire school. That's that's important now, uh, but it it was in the in the wall. So did he help with the construction of the building as well? Mm -mm. He just went in there and put it in there. This guy, as you're going to see, was a genius, electrical genius. So except for the fact that he messed up the wiring. And thank God he did. Yes. Superintendent, which tell us what a superintendent does. A superintendent in in at least today's um structure is pretty much the head administrator for the school um district so he's the figurehead so for our school district our superintendent is the chief officer he's and like, they get elected uh the the board yes the school board votes on the superintendent like that's part of local elections local too, elections right so that's the um, same no not well not for our district the the people don't have a choice in the school school uh, superintendent interesting the school board is the one who uh voted votes for the superintendent like for example our previous superintendent was superintendent for over 30 years he it wasn't up, up for public election now the school board is up for ah, local okay. election got it but they the school board um their representatives of of the district of the people but they have ultimate say in a lot of things in the district Got it. So it's kind of the same today. Andrew Kehoe, the killer here, was elected as a treasurer. And that's important because why? Like, this is a brand new school. Brand new. In a small town. That's a lot of money. Where's that money come from? He's got to manage that. Like, mm-hmm. this is a big state-of-the-art school. It costs a lot of money yeah. mm-hmm. oh, to yeah. do that. And new construction. Yeah. Exactly. So him and this guy, Emery Hoyuk, the superintendent, would often butt heads. So the superintendent knew immediately who perpetrated this. This, once they found the dynamite, because before that, they thought it was just a, a gas explosion or whatever. Mm, right. That's what I thought the whole entire time. But they found the dynamite and the 500 pounds of unexploded dynamite. And that's when the superintendent knew immediately who it was. This is Andrew Kehoe and his wife, Nellie. If you guys want to look at the screen, neither one of you guys are looking at the damn screen. I looked at my screen. I'm sorry. I got confused. OK, his, his that's Kehoe and his wife, Nellie. Yeah. Now, Smoking a cigar, leaned back in his chair. 
Does he seem like someone that would kill 38 school children? I mean, no. Uh, no. Although he, uh, like, I get the impression that he's wealthy. Yeah. He almost looks like our district superintendent. Weird. Not not identical, not quite, but just kind of like, I don't know, he reminds me of The persona? Like yeah, he just kind of reminds me of him. You know, I haven't really ever had a conversation with our superintendent. Oh, look at this, man. This is some of the dynamite. Oh, dang. You see how it's wow. kind of wired up? Yeah, that's crazy. This is a portion of the alarm clock and wiring. I mean, look at all these wires and shit. Forgive me for being ignorant, but what exactly is in dynamite? Just explosives? Yeah, like, it's just I thought it was just kind of like, and we put it in the stick. Like, what is what is a stick made of? I, thought, I always thought like dynamite would be like in a candlestick type thing. Yeah, it is. Oh. That's what it is. It's a stick of base. All like it a is candlestick is filled with gunpowder? Gun yeah, and a blasting cap. That's all it is. Oh. Now, you'll hear the term pyrotol in this one, too. It's the same thing. Pyrotol is a cheaper alternative during the Great World War, which the first world war they they needed a cheaper form of dynamite because dynamite's really expensive mm -hmm. so someone manufactured this thing a highly explosive called pyrotol which is basically the same thing different chemicals is, okay. Oh, okay i was gonna ask if it was kind of like how uh like we call all elastic bandages band-aids or call all no facial tissue kleenex or tissue but you can't just buy dynamite you you have to be like issued it by the government and the reason you would be issued dynamite and pyrotol Pyrotol is because you're a farmer in Bath and let's say you have a tree that needs to be taken down or a big stump or a big boulder. You need to remove it from your yard. That's why you would have this dynamite. That's the only reason you would have this dynamite. You can't get it anywhere else. It was controlled by the government. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't hear of people like today purchasing dynamite or py pirate hall. You don't hear of that. That's not something that people I mean, have. I would definitely be worried why somebody's buying that. But yeah, I mean, unless they're doing it to like, you know, like break foundation or blow up some rocks. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, actually, I'm not going to say. Go on. This man, Andrew Kehoe, you just saw, is barreling down. Could you see him, that photo with an evil grin, showing all of his teeth? That guy would never forget that. All of his teeth. He kind of looks like the skeleton behind you, actually. I mean, uh, I, I can't see him doing like a maniacal no, Cruella de Vil grin, but I can see him like, I feel like he's more of the type to go like, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, like, like money hands, like Mr. Burns kind of, but like, Petting. yeah, the superintendent, the cat, like James Bond. Yes. The or, or the Spice Girls movie. Yeah, yeah. The superintendent, Emery Hoyuk, as he was struggling with the debris, he pulls a child's body from this rubble. This child was dead. He hands his child off to a nurse and who pulls up? barreling down full speed right up to the structure. None other than the guy that blew this entire school up. He's coming to admire his work. And the superintendent knew exactly who it was, why he did it. And now he's actually coming there to the school. But on just to play devil's advocate, if he was the treasurer of the school and, and, and had a role at the school and was employed by the school, one could argue that the reason he was there is because he was concerned and like that these are people I worked with every day blah 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 blah. but obviously if we already know it's him but you know like right. in his mind instead of staying away he rushed down there to be like oh my god like what's going on at the school like I'm a concerned mm -hmm. board member you know what I mean right but they knew it was him he's given the the school a lot of problems mm. in the past plus he's the only one that had access to this the school full time you know because he was like not even the principal didn't have like master key I mean, I, this is the 20s. I'm not going to argue. Go on. All right. So he pulls up with this grin. Emery hands this dead baby to the to a nurse and he runs over to Andrew Kehoe's truck. He's going to, I don't know, rip this guy, a new one. rip this guy's head off. Oh. He runs over to the truck. Now, they were enemies. Not really, though, because in they were enemies in Andrew's mind. Mm. Frenemies. The superintendent couldn't carry the weight. He was just wondering why this guy has been such a douche and such a dick about things, trying to get him fired and stuff, you know. But to Andrew, they were enemies. So with this ghastly grin, he pulls up to the school and Emery runs over there. He's going to literally just rip this guy apart. There's a struggle. Witnesses would say that Kehoe is reaching down for a shotgun or a handgun, a pistol or something. He's going to kill the superintendent who he hated. He's going to finish him off right there. That was his last mission. He's going to finish this guy off. 
So they couldn't see what he was reaching for. And then four or five other men rush over there. They're going to help the superintendent. They're going to take this guy out. They're going to just beat him to death. So now you have all these men trying to pull Kehoe out of his car. And Kehoe is reaching down to grab some sort of rifle or shotgun. Words were exchanged. A struggle took place. Charles Rawson claimed that Kehoe, who was kneeling on the front seat, had a handgun that he'd fired at the rear of his vehicle, while Huck tried to wrestle it from his grasp. Others say that the weapon was a shotgun or rifle. A few claimed that Kehoe had no weapon at all, but had reached down and flipped some sort of switch. Whatever happened next, however, was never in dispute. Mm. As Charles Rawson put it, the whole car went up and the man went in every direction. This what? is this is Kehoe's car. <gasps> he blew himself up? He had made this car, this truck, and you can't see any more of it. If you're looking at it now, you just see the, the rear of it is completely mangled. And you know how they made trucks back in the day. They made them to last. Heavy metal, heavy mm-hmm. steel. That's what we learn on American Pickers. This thing. I love American Pickers. Which I'll, so good. I'll put this photo on talkmore.com. You know, it might also like Swap Shop. Oh, maybe we should. Mm -hmm. It's on Netflix, I think, or Prime. This truck is completely mangled, almost not even there anymore. The back of it is is gone completely. Andrew Kehoe had rigged up his truck with enough dynamite to kill everyone who was trying to wrestle him out of this car. What the fuck? So he was like a kamikaze driver. Yeah, like why though? Because he was disturbed. A lot of the injuries, the 55 non-fatal injuries, and even some fatal ones come from this, were because of this truck. Wow. In this truck, he had done another thing that no one's ever done before and set a new a new first. He had made his truck into an, an explosive IED, basically. In the back of the truck, which you can no longer see because it's completely shredded up, was nuts, bolts, scrap metal, nails, Whoa. nails, anything that could be used as flying shrapnel. Oh, it's projectiles. Projectile. That truck went up, killed everyone that was right at the truck instantly. Even 50 to 100 yards away, people were getting injured. I'm going to show you one person that their skull was, skull was removed, eyes removed, legs removed because of the flying shrapnel. It was basically a Claymore mine, which Claymores have all these little BBs in it and it blows up and that's what kills you all the BBs. It was a improvised explosive device. That is the first time in history. Maybe not. That's what IED stands for. Yeah. Improvised explosive device. I never knew. That is the first time in history. Maybe not an IED was used, but an IED was used in a terrorist act. Uh, In the public. In the public. That is fucking crazy. He had rigged his whole truck was filled with scrap metal, just sharp, rusted, like the one that would just just go right through your arm. Cut it off. That's so nails, scary. Nails, bolts, screws. This incident in itself is a disaster. Yeah. And then you like pile this on top of the school. Yeah. You can see the photos of his truck at the end was completely mangled. Wow. That what was that was left of Kehoe's car. This little thing, like this is another car. This is not the car. This is the car. This is what's left. So what do you have? The back Two wheel? tires. Two tires? Like, Maybe. Wh- where did the other shit go? That before? This is someone else's car. Oh. Right here. This is Eddie Do- Doomhelmer's car. The location of his body was found, which we're going to show you. Did you guys expect that? No. No. So what the fuck? Why is this guy? What is wrong with this guy? Also, an interesting point that you got to think about when it comes to mass murderers. Let's go back to the Gilded Age before this happened. We haven't done a lot of the stories because they're not really popular. But what were people really scared of back then as far as like a a killer? Pestilence. No, no. As far as someone killing them. Oh. And just in like all cases, less than 1% of everything I'm about to tell you happens. But yet the whole populace is terrified of this. In the Gilded Age, the 18 to 1900s was poisoners. Strychnine was available. Mm -hmm. Everyone was getting poisoned, it seemed. But yet less than 1% of homicides, people were getting poisoned. But that was it back then. People were scared of poisoners. Well, we were scared of poisoners at one point, too, with the anthrax situation. No, but it's not the same. Like, that was the thing. That was a serial killer back then. Poisoners. Poisoners in the Gilded Age. All right. How about the 
cities. Now you have the rise of the serial killer. Everyone's so scared of the serial killer. Yeah. And, you know, what about today? Is not no one's scared of serial killer. Are you scared of a serial killer? No. What I mean, I talk of? about it too much. Yeah, but you're not. No one is scared of a serial killer. No, because you think somebody's going to get caught real fast. Yeah. Like, no, no, it no. can't go on. No, no, no. The, the public, the public yeah. is not scared of totally. a serial killer. Totally. Do you There's know no- why? Why? Because they're scared of something else. They're scared of a mass shooting. Boom. So that is what we're living in now. But it's good to know that way back 100 years ago, it was poisoners that was scaring people, the public. If you go in all the newspapers, that's what you see. Just like the serial killers of the 80s. That's yeah. all you heard about is poisoners. Fascinating point. Yeah. The, the 80s, all you hear about is serial killers. Mm-hmm. Serial killers, serial killers. Even though less than 1% of homicides happen with each of these categories. Now you have mass shootings shooters less than one percent still i mean i mean how many so we had like i don't know 20 mass shootings this year whatever maybe 100 200 people dead literally 200 people die every day in chicago literally you know what i'm saying like less than one percent but we're all fucking terrified of it right serial killers are a little bit different than mass shooters poisoners are a little bit different than that as well like when you think about murder you don't typically think that it's going to be someone who you don't know those are as we know as podcasters especially in true crime true crime podcasters we know that murders are usually a very intimate act but mass shooters don't give a fuck who they're killing their aim is to kill their aim is to harm there may be a target that they are like have a personal right right. but i mean like so i would say that people like it their fear is maybe not justified to walk on eggshells every single day but uh, to have it in the back of your head to be aware of situations you know like you're more likely to encounter a mass shooter than you are someone to murder you i think like who you know unless you're like i don't know i I don't know maybe that's a maybe that's a wrong statistic no i'm saying like what the pop what the public what people are afraid like in the 90s satanic panic oh yeah yeah, yeah. how about about this no i see what you're saying how about how about this right here the serial killer wants to kill the whole thing is killing as many people as possible all right a few years ago this guy samuel little he is known Mm -hmm. for killing between 90 and 120 females who is he i don't know no one fucking knows you know why because no one cares anymore it's not the serial killer people care about yeah it's the fucking mass shooters and stuff yeah that's like what this, people are afraid of that's what people yeah, yeah. get that's what get, exactly, keeps yeah, yeah. parents up at night and, yeah, yeah. and keeps you from wanting to go to anywhere public you know the reason I did this story is it's not just the world is right now it's, on, it's always been going, going on, on for it's fucking oh. a lot yeah you hear about it all the time because that's what the public is is yeah, seeing that's what the media is showing yeah but a in, of, in the yeah. 1900s man everyone was getting poisoned it seemed like yeah. and that was like the thing and everyone yeah. was like the world's going to hell all this shit mm. you know and so i don't know that's kind of why i did this story because this is this i mean as far as a school massacre this is it man yeah i mean this dude fucking was about to kill 200 fucking kids it's crazy 200 kids but you have a good point i mean like there's always going to be something going on there's always going to be a popular topic and and the thing is the people that are directly affected this is not a two-day news story this is the rest of their life that they have to deal with this yeah. so yeah. so this guy he didn't think he was doing anything wrong he thought he was justified and he would later write they found it written on his barn that uh killers aren't born they are made that's mm. what he, he wrote on the side of his barn that's creepy also so, it must have taken him a long time to write that so you know that there's a a cause but yeah i mean i don't know for him to do this is uh kind of crazy so we have the, the we have that on the side of his barn but do we know what his motive was did did we have any suggestions from the superintendent or going back to his truck being exploded kehoe's body and the other men of the truck were quote hurled fully 100 feet two men at the truck glenn smith and his father Nelson McFerrin were at the, were at the truck. Nelson McFerrin was killed instantly, quote, mangled almost beyond recognition. His torso was all that remained of this guy. They found it 100 yards away, quote, resting beneath a tree. Smith his son-in-law was a little bit luckier. The only thing that happened to him was his left leg was blown sheer off. At least he got to say his goodbyes before he died from that wound spurting out blood all over the grass. His last words about seven minutes later was, quote, I don't want anyone to feel bad if I go, end quote. Uh Now, these were the guys right by the truck. 
Parts of Andrew Kehoe, the bomber, were also found. For instance, his head was found 100 feet away. Wow. They could identify his head, well, pieces of his head. They can identify that that was him because he had a, a, a unique gray patch of hair on his head, and that was the only thing that survived. Mm. It was a body, albeit one blown all to hell. The corpse was completely gutted, a ripped up carcass, a hunk of meat and bone. Though the body was in shambles, the face and the head were more or less intact. Gray hair matted what remained of the skull. That was Andrew Kehoe's skull. Ugh. Still trying to understand why. The truck explosion injured at least 15 other bystanders. Some horribly, some people actually died. The It was known as his, quote, grand satanic gesture. That's what one paper said. Of how the maniac packed the bed of his truck with scrap metal, nuts, bolts, nails, anything that could act as shrapnel. This is the first car bomb ever used. I mean, the guy is an electrical genius, as you'll see. You know what I'm saying? So. Well, he fucked up. Oh, no. He Thank didn't. God. Yeah. yeah. He did. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I got confused and then I reconfused myself. Have Mi- you ever been double confused? It's really confusing. Miss <laughs> Miss Miss Anna Perone was standing near the truck a little bit further away, not in the blast zone. She was standing there with her infant daughter, whose name was Rose. Luckily, the baby survived. Rose, the infant she was cradling. However, Anna's eyeball was torn out and a piece of shrapnel had blew a part of her skull mm. from its from its structure. Surgeons did save her, though, after removing, quote, 62 pieces of her bone and a portion of her brain. Oh, holy shit. Superintendent Emery Hoyek was reduced to a, quote, terrible hunk of blood and bone and and hair (gasps) bearing some likeness to a human body. Though ripped to tatters, enough of his checkered sports coat remained to allow those who had seen him in the morning to identify his remains. Damn. Just from a coat. Others were also killed from the car, from the uh, from the truck blast, like Cleo Clayton, an eight-year-old boy who survived the school bombing, was pulled out of the rubble, was reunited with his father in a grand gesture, only to be blown up by the truck 30 minutes later. He was, quote, ripped apart from his stomach to his spine. So who the fuck would do this, right? I mean, I feel like he he feels he's been wronged. Okay. He well, was tell dis- me tell dis- me how dissatisfied with the way that the school is being run. This is the treasurer. Okay. Maybe he maybe he stole funds or misappropriated money. No, like a Bud Dwyer situation. I don't think so because I mean this was pure hatred. It, I feel like he's been wronged. I mean maybe it's because I read the story, but well, you know if he's been wronged or not. But but I, he's <laughs> you read the story. I, that's what I'm saying. But would he kill? Try to kill 250 kids if he stole funds and he knows he was wrong. So so it's really he feels like he's getting revenge on something that happened to him. What did he target? The school. The school. Yeah. What did I tell you about the school? This was state of the recently built so did he was he pissed that this was what he felt a waste of tax dollars yeah that's close think what what year is it 1927 1927 depression that doesn't happen to 1930 1929 october 29 black tuesday so 27 Hmm. there was something else that was happening that no one else really knew about unless you were a farmer the Great World War, World War One, mm-hmm. okay, which was like, I don't know, 1919 or some shit. Mm-hmm. Then, which was known as the Great War because they didn't know there was going to be another one <laughs> at that time. <laughs> All right. Stick with me. because Stick with me. I'll go through this kind of quick. But it makes sense. This will make sense to you. The Great War was a boon to American farmers. Why? Because the Great War was something fought in Europe. So what happens when Europe blows itself up and kills everyone, kills all the farm and destroys all the farming equipment and we had all to export everything and all the fruit and all the vegetables and all the sustenance? America's here. We grow a lot of shit. We grow a lot of stuff. We could send it over. So what does that do? It's a boom. It brings in money. It brings in money, but what what happens when you there's such a high demand? Low on supply. Something? What? Like, was there low supply f- no, no. for our own? You need more food land. Population? You need you need, you need more land to to increase your supply so that you can continue to provide. This is what happens. The world the world war 
decimates Europe. They need food. We're the people that can supply them American farmers. American farmers who are not known to be rich because farms nowadays are different. They're like corporate Huge. conglomerates. Yeah. But in the 20s, these were farms owned by individual farmers. So now the demand is so great, which means the money they're making, they can charge for a single bushel of tomatoes. Let's say they charge $5 today. That sounds accurate, actually. With a dem- with the demand so high, they can now charge $12, $15. So now they're all like, damn, I'm a poor ass farmer and I'm kind of getting rich here. Mm. So what do I do? Well, let's buy more land. Let's keep this party going, right? Mm. Let's buy more land, grow more food. Yeah. Let's buy more land and grow more food, which means they're taking out new mortgages on land. Uh huh. And it's all, you know, they're reading the Forbes magazine and smoking their cigar like Andrew Kehoe was because he was there smoking Mm -hmm. that cigar in that photo. Mm -hmm. Andrew Kehoe was a farmer wearing his nice suit. He's making all this money. They're shipping fruit and vegetables over to Europe. But guess what? They recover eventually. Their economy recovers. And now what? You have all these farmers who have all this land, who are growing all this crop that no one's eating because they got their own. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now you put them in a predicament. This is known as the farm crisis. And this was around this time. This was actually right before the Great Depression. Right. Okay. So this was a depression in of itself on farm, on farm land and farmers. They, they make all this money and then all of a sudden, boom, there's no demand anymore. Farm crisis. This was in 1922 bankrupts they can't these farmers can't pay the mortgages for their new farmland they can't even sell anything anymore their prices are plummeting okay i mean they're they're stuck they're stuck with these ruined crops they can't even sell and this land they can't pay for now they're now they're actually defaulting on their mortgages and losing their own farmland wow what has and this was happening all over the united states and this was happening to kehoe all right so we know that's happening in 1922 you have farmers struggling. You want to build a what? A school. A school. You we wanna build need them kids to work in the farm. No, you want to build a school? Well, where's the money coming from? It's coming from the farmers. It's coming from the taxes. Mm. That the farmers, that Bath in Michigan is farmers. These farmers are now struggling to even live, to eat, to feed their family. And now you want them to pay for a million dollar school? Mm-hmm. That makes sense, right? That would piss a lot of people off. Yeah. I, mean, I would be more upset with the institution than what, than trying to take it out with those poor little babies. But not only that, Andrew Kehoe, he's brilliant. All the other farmers are really smart, too. I didn't have a million dollar school. I went in this little schoolhouse where this little teacher I had to get there early, get the water, heat the school with fire. Y'all I'm don't fine. need that. I'm mm-hmm. fine. Y'all don't need this million dollar school just because this big city's doing it. What am I going to do? I'm going to try to get elected tr- to treasurer and I'm going to try to to nix this whole school situation. You know, mm-hmm. you see, you see the motivation yeah. now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but why did he have to have the bombs go off when the kids were when school was in session? Why couldn't he have just bombed the building when no one was there? But um, then it would have been even more of a waste. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. Like uh, either way, like you're then, and then they now would have you're had to destroying pay to repair, the building. Yeah. You're destroying the whole building let, that's already been paid for. Let, you know what I mean? Yeah. Let me. Uh, you know what? I can sum this guy up completely without even telling you any of his background. All right. Disgruntled. There was a. There was a note, a pa- there was a package. That Another s- bomb? That he sent out and he sent this package out to the, like the attorney who oversaw the school funds. He sent him a package the day before he did this. What do you think was in that package? A bomb. What do you think it was? A letter? No, it was a package. It was a package. It had something in it. Tomatoes. heavy. What do you think it was in there? Uh, well, Jen's guess was a bomb. This will sum this guy up completely. I mean, we'll go through his background, but this will sum this up. In this package. I feel like it was, it, it's, it, <laughs> hang on, before you say it, I'm going to say it was kind of like a mob message. Like it was like somebody's pinky, but like, you know, like a piece of farm equipment or something to be like. A cowtail. My, yeah, my not farm is shot, you know? All right, well, read the letter that was sent to this attorney. Okay, I almost said the same thing, Wolfie. Now, They, the authorities, as soon as they realized that he sent this letter, they confiscated it. I mean, it was a package because they thought it was a bomb. So this was a whole thing. This is, could be a whole story in of itself. Because it was like sent to the wrong address, which was in the wrong town, which somebody else got it and could have opened. So this was like a whole story in of itself. 
Dear Sir, I am leaving the school board and turning over to you all my accounts. They are all in this box. Due to an uncashed check, the bank had 22 cents more than my book showed when I took them over. Due to an error on the part of the secretary in order number 118, dated November 18th, 1925. He changed the figures on the order after the check had been sent to the payer, payee. The bank gained one cent more over my books, making the bank account 23 cents more than my books. Otherwise, I'm sure you will find my books exactly right. Thank you for going my bond. Sincerely yours, A.P. Kehoe. Oh, he, did he send him 23 cents? He sent this the day before. He's been planting these bombs for nearly a year. And he sent this message saying, oh, just in case you wonder, the the account shows 23 cents more than what it really is. And this is why. That was it. There was no bomb. They were, it was just folders of the accounts because he's turning the financial accounts over to him of the school that he just demolished. And he sends this saying that it's 20 three cents over that is fucking it's almost crazy like he wants to say like i did i did my job right oh that's a and good you point. didn't yeah that's and a I, good point. like i know my numbers to a t and y'all are the ones that fucked up yeah that's a good point hmm. Hmm. it's an interesting message to send though I will say one thing about his background. I'm not going to get into it now. I think we might put it in later, but he didn't particularly like his stepmother when he was growing up Mm. and mainly because they were pretty close in age. Oh, yeah. So this is when he was 18 and she was 23, I think. In 1911, the stepmother, Frances, Frances, which they called him, which they called her Franny, had tried to light the kitchen stove. Remember I told you about the gasoline Mm -hmm. stoves, how it Mm -hmm. blows people up? Mm -hmm. All right. The kitchen stove, gasoline powered, touted at the time as, quote, the modern instrument of destruction. Oh, end quote. It was here and then it wasn't because it went out of fashion real quick. Put this in your kitchen today. (laughs) They literally took them out in a year. No one bought them anymore. Cook your roast or roast your family. Oh, my God. Here's some of the warnings. Quote, don't put the tank on the stove when you fill it. The gas tank. Yeah. The God. gasoline tank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't fill the tank while the burners are lit. Don't uh. light the burners after the pipes have leaked over everything. Don't try to operate the stove if you don't thoroughly understand it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And anyway, um, Harold Schechter in his book says, quote, exactly which, if any, of these precautions Francis Kehoe, his stepmother, violated is not known. What is certain is that when she put a match to the stove, it exploded, engulfing her in flames. Oh, my gosh. Andrew was there. And instead of putting her out, quote, he stood and watched her burn (gasps) for a while. Damn. And then he finally went and filled the bucket pell up with water after he watched her for a, quite a while. Quote, got a pell of water and threw it over her, liquefying what little skin she had <gasps> left. Oh, no. She was beyond repair. The doctor said she was, quote, muscles roasted to the bone. Ugh. Little more than a blackened lump, they said. Her death was labeled as an accident. I don't think so. Of the hundreds of other gasoline stoves. I'm not going to go through his... his uh, his background but this is way too long i will say that the neighbors noticed that before this happened that his crops were rotting and stuff like that it seems like he disregarded them he did have a wife at the time nelly and she was burned to death he basically lit her on fire he, he well, like before he went yeah in the car. yeah oh, and, so that's why they said they could see his house on fire on his way oh, down yeah got it got it got it her like legs were broken from what i was reading so he be, like miseried her yeah misered yeah i guess so yeah And then he basically lit his barn on fire. And for several years, he was the treasurer and stuff like that. And he was trying to get the school basically non-commissioned, but that didn't happen. And then he was trying to cut every penny he could. Like the superintendent, he tried to cut his annual raise of $200 and he could only get it cut to $100 and stuff like that. He was very, he was extremely frugal with that because I mean, he was a farmer and he was broke and he was suffering, you know? And he was angry. And yeah. The waste, what he saw was waste. He said, 
says, quote, my assessments don't leave me enough to live on. That's what he told one neighbor. It was bad before we built the new schoolhouse. Now I'm being taxed into the poor house. Mm. So he did this because of the school. And and that and that's that was and that's what, what it was. Wow. So Dang. that's all. I'm not gonna go through everything, the background and everything. I think that's uh pretty much it. That was crazy. Hope you guys like that. Well done. Yeah, good job, yeah. John. This guy has a very high IQ. So you know, he says that he was made this way, but there's no excuse killing children. He could have blown the school up all day long on the day that no one was there. The next day. You know what I'm saying? But he chose to do it this day in the morning. 9.45 is when that clock went off. And that's when he chose to do it. So I don't know if you want to say mental health or not. He was high IQ, extremely smart, disgruntled. Yeah, but you know, to do that is just terrible. No excuse. I know. It's yeah. just crazy. But I wanted to kind of do that because, you know, all the shit that's going on. The world people have been stuff. fucked up for a long time yeah, yeah. Ever really since, since like, ever since the serpent in the garden of yeah, Eden. yeah. pandora's box whatever you're Fucking crazy but anyway that's it so i hope you guys like that and thanks for sticking with us so until next time good night you lovely lovely people